good afternoon. My name is Melissa Huyak and welcome to my PhD DDS. So today I will summarize some of the contributions of my thesis titled Flying Flat Out, Fast Multi-Rotor Flight Using Vision-Based Navigation in Real World Environments. So why multi-rotors? Well, they have a wide range of applications, including infrastructure inspection, transportation, search and rescue, and mapping operations. And this is enabled by the fact that they are mechanically simple and yet highly maneuverable and agile. And yet on the other hand, they present a challenge for robust and reliable autonomous navigation. And this is due to the fact that they're both constrained in terms of the types of onboard sensors and in terms of their onboard computation due to weight. And so I thought I'd, thought I'd start with a little bit of an action photo of our multi-rotor, um, and this was taken at a field trial at Defense Research and Development in Canada and Suffield. So my research has been driven by the motivation to move multi-rotors from lab demonstrations to real world environments where they can support these applications. And the key considerations in this transition is that we want to be able to exploit the multi-rotor speed and agility. We wanna be able to rely on onboard compute and onboard sensors. So to fly autonomously, we rely on a controller. And the controller's role is to compute a commanded action to achieve some desired objective. So for example, to fly a planned path at some desired speed using feedback. So what are the challenges to flying in some of these real world environments that I just mentioned? Well, real world environments have unknown disturbances and changing dynamics. And this can be a result of wind or varying payloads. And ideally, we would like to account for these things without human intervention and on board the UAV. The second challenge is that real world environments may not have reliable GPS. And this could be a result of intentional jamming or effects like multipath propagation. And so vision-based navigation, where we rely predominantly on an onboard camera as a backup for feedback is both a low cost and lightweight alternative. So my thesis has two parts. Uh, part one is called exploiting flatness structure. And in part two, I'll talk about autonomous vision-based flight. So the work in this thesis has resulted in a number of first author peer-reviewed conference and journal publications, and I briefly uh, list them here. So we'll start with uh, part one. So fast flight in real world environments requires accounting for nonlinear and unknown dynamics with computationally tractable control algorithms that can be used on board in a high frequency feedback loop. So one idea to achieve this is to exploit a structural property of many nonlinear models, including multi-rotors known as differential flatness. And intuitively, what differential flatness allows us to do is to rewrite the nonlinear dynamics as a nonlinear term or transformation and a linear dynamics. And so a common control approach for differentially flat systems is feedback linearization, which tries to cancel the nonlinear term and then design a linear controller based on the linear dynamics. And the value of this is that this is very computationally efficient. However, in reality, performance and safety are limited by the mismatch between the actual system dynamics and our model. And so we explored control design that exploits differential flatness, but is able to achieve high performance and safety despite the mismatch between the nominal model and the actual system. So in the first part of this thesis, I investigated some of the ways that exploiting flattened structure can be used for efficient prediction and safe learning. So I'll start with flatness based model predictive control. So in the proposed flatness based model predictive control, we exploit differential flatness to couple a model predictive controller that uses the linear dynamics with feed forward linearization that corrects for the nonlinear term. So why feed forward linearization? as opposed to the more standard feedback linearization. Well, using feed forward linearization is often more robust to model parameter errors and time delays. So we look at a simulation example and we want to track the reference in black. 
And we compare the performance when using feed-forward linearization and model predictive control, which that's FMPC in red, and feedback linearization and model predictive control in gray. And in this case, with the model parameter error, we got a 56% error reduction simply using feed-forward linearization. And we also look at the case where there is an input time delay and see a 70% error reduction. So why model predictive control or MPC? Well, model predictive control can achieve high performance and explicitly adhere to constraints on the state and inputs. And it does this by solving an optimization problem where we minimize a cost, which includes predicted future errors, subject to a prediction dynamics model and constraints. And the prediction dynamics model can be a nonlinear model and we call that nonlinear MPC. It can be a linear model where we've linearized about an operating point. So for multi-rotors, that's often hover, and we call that linear MPC. And, or it could be, or we could use the linear dynamics from differential flatness, and we call this flatness-based MPC. So we compare these approaches on two simple trajectories, a step in the XZ and a circled trajectory. So linear MPC solves a convex optimization problem and takes around 0.5 milliseconds to compute. Flatness-based MPC takes around 1.6 milliseconds to compute and also solves a convex optimization problem. And one iteration of nonlinear MPC takes around 5.9 milliseconds to compute. And what we see is that for the extra one millisecond required for flatness-based MPC, this can result in improved performance over linear MPC by still accounting for the nonlinearities without being susceptible to local minima. So I'll now briefly discuss our work on a flatness-based uh, learn stability filter. So learning-based control has been shown to outperform conventional model-based techniques in the presence of model uncertainties and systematic disturbances. However, many state-of-the-art learning-based controllers still lack formal guarantees. And so we learn a filter that can augment any controller for controller-fine differentially flat systems to efficiently certify robot tracking stability and input constraints in the presence of model uncertainty. So compared to the most closely related work, our approach can be applied to trajectory tracking tasks while providing stability and tracking guarantees without assuming that the unknown disturbance or dynamics is only state dependent. However, we are required to make two assumptions. Firstly, that uh, the system dynamics are control F fine. And secondly, that they're differentially flat. So, I'm going to add a little bit of notation. So we'll call the input from the linear controller VD. I'll call the commanded action U. I'll call the input seen by the linear dynamics V and I'll call and state Z. So we propose learning the nonlinear term as a Gaussian process that takes in inputs comprising of the state Z and the action U and outputs V. And I'll call this psi of A. So Gaussian processes are a non-parametric approach to learning a nonlinear function. And it does this by assuming that the function values are random variables and that any finite number of these random variables have a joint Gaussian distribution. And it relies on a prior kernel function, which essentially encodes for two input points how uh, similar their respective function values are. And the value of a Gaussian process is that as we add data, the most likely function or mean function, as you can see highlight, highlighted by the line, changes. And so does the uncertainty around that data point. So you can see as we add more data, how the mean function and uncertainty change around the areas where we have data. So we use this Gaussian process model in a probabilistic feedback or feed forward linearization where our objective is to compute the input that is most likely to cancel the nonlinear term. We also include a stability filter that uses the uncertainty from the Gaussian process to guarantee tracking convergence with high probability. And we can include input constraints. And this is an optimization problem. 
And the key is that by exploiting the following kernel selection, we can rewrite this optimization problem as a second order cone program. And this is very efficient to solve. So we compare the average tracking error on increasingly aggressive trajectories, and we compare a nominal linear controller, LQR, our proposed filter, SOCP, and a robust linear controller, LQR. So we see around a 90% error reduction over the robust LQR. But significantly, our filter takes around five milliseconds to compute compared to around 300 milliseconds for the robust LQR. So our approach has a computational time nearly two orders of magnitude smaller than really robust controllers. Now on to part two, autonomous vision-based flight. So of course I have to introduce our uh, DJIM 600 setup. Some of you might have seen it flying outside. So this is our DJIM 600 Pro, our Ronin gimbal or gimbaled camera. All computation is done on board on the NVIDIA TX2 and we use a Stereo Labs camera. So we use a vision-based navigation framework known as Visual Teach and Repeat. And Visual Teach and Repeat is a vision-based method of teaching navigatable routes. So by learning a safe route under GPS control, VTNR enables the UAV to fly home visually under GPS failure. So to initiate the system, the UAV takes off under GPS-based position control. While performing a primary task, the system generates a relative pose graph from visual odometry. And then following a simulated GPS failure, the UAV flies back along the path by matching visual features to landmarks in the pose graph. So the green circles that you're seeing are the successfully matched visual features, and we call those localization inliers. So here's another example of our VTNR system in an autonomous demonstration in downtown Montreal. So this looks great, <laughs> but in all these videos, we are only flying autonomously at two to three meters per second. So naturally, what are the limitations to high-speed vision-based flight? So visual navigation, I'll include uh, visual perception that estimates a relative location and estimation that then determines the state used by the controller. So for simplicity, visual perception will include both visual odometry and visual localization. So the first limitation is that most current state-of-the-art controllers are perception agnostic. And what this means is that they assume that the commanded action computed by the controller has no effect on the ability of vision-based navigation to determine the UAV's location or localization. So in our VTNR, partial knowledge of the environment is limited to a visual map created during teach. And so what can happen is that the controller can produce an action, for example, to prioritize speed, that leads to a location where we cannot localize well with respect to the map. And we see this in the video is that we go to a location where the number of localization inliers, the green circles, is very low and then disappears. And in fact, poor performance of either the control or perception is simply reinforced through the feedback loop between these two subsystems. So to reinforce this point, we fly another circular path in red as the teach, and then repeat at increasing speeds from two all the way up to six meters per second using vision and a perception agnostic PD controller. And at six meters per second, at around vertex number 50, the error is too large with the teach path and the number of inliers drops to zero. And so we say that localization is lost. And what we see is that the path error increases and the vehicle actually cannot recover from this point. So to enable fast flight in real world environments using vision-based navigation, we develop a perception aware model predictive controller that can account for its effect on visual localization. So our proposed approach has a few uh, novel contributions. So firstly, the perception model varies along the path. It doesn't require training by deviating from the path. 
and it considers rotational errors. On the control integration side, the path is adapted based on the visual information, and we can account for multiple visual features. So to do this, we first develop a geometric perception model. So imagine that the green star represents the landmark seen in Teach. So when we repeat, we have some error with Teach. So we use two angles in our model. So the first is the parallax angle, and this is the angle between the rays from the landmark to the cameras. And it captures the perspective change and is a function of only the path error. The second angle is the view angle. And it is the angle between the current camera optical axis and the landmark. And it captures the field of view and is, it is a function of the path error and gibble rotation. So we use all our data from Suffield and Montreal, so over 12 kilometers of flight data. And for each landmark and teach, each time we repeat, we compute the parallax and view angles and mark whether this landmark was selected as a localization in Lyre or not. And so we plot the parallax angle view angles versus the normalized frequency of the landmark selected as an inline. And there are some interesting things to notice. So firstly, in all our data at a parallax angle or perspective change of more than 15 degrees, we have never successfully matched a landmark. Secondly, at a view angle of around 45 degrees, we have never matched a landmark. So we then take a frequentist approach and let the normalized frequency represent a probability of a landmark being matched as an inline. And we fit a best fit model to associate the probability with a parallax and view angle. So we want the chance of localization failure to be low. And so we can encode this as a chance constraint where the probability of the number of localization in liars being below some threshold is very small. So to convert this to a constraint that we can actually use in our controller, we make two additional assumptions. Firstly, we assume that each landmark is an independent random Bernoulli trial with probability based on our geometric perception model. So the expected number of landmarks is then simply the sum of these probabilities. Secondly, we assume that the resulting distribution, we, 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 we approximate the resulting distribution by a normal distribution. And we can do this by using Lyapunov's central limit theorem and because we are considering around five to 600 landmarks at each teach vertex. And what this allows us to do is to rewrite this chance constraint as a nonlinear function of the path error and gimbal orientation. And the gimbal orientation is matching that during teach. And so the dominant term is the path error. So to create a perception aware model predictive controller, we augment a model predictive controller with the perception constraint, which is a nonlinear constraint on the position. And the additional information that's needed by the controller then includes the landmarks from teach and the gimbal orientation. So uh, we teach the same geometric path, but with the camera pointing in different directions. So we go from star, corner one, corner two, and end. And the only difference is in that in the first case, we face the camera towards the road when we teach. In the second case, we face the camera towards the trees. So we look at the case when we face the camera towards the trees, and we compare the path under different constraints in the controller. So no path error constraint, none. Um, a, six, a fixed path error constraint of six meters, five meters, four meters, three meters, two meters, and one meter. And what we see is that at a fixed path error constraint of three meters, we can guarantee localization. And then we also compare um, our perception aware constraint or PA. So the first thing that we see is that we don't need to fly under different fixed path error constraints to ensure localizability as it's explicitly accounted for. And when we compare the average speed, we observe a slightly higher average speed over the three meter path error constraint. But in the case when we look towards the road, however, we have a higher speed over both the four meter and five meter fixed path error constraint, even though in these cases, localization is not guaranteed. So we see the optimal path um, at, a desired, at our desired speed of 10 meters per second when the camera is pointing towards the trees in blue and towards uh, the road in green. 
And this is with our, our perception aware constraint. And this is kind of the point is that a different camera, di camera direction results in a different optimal path. The second limitation is that many controllers rely on perfect state estimation from vision-based navigation. And an accurate full state estimate is often challenging to obtain due to typically noisy IMU measurements and infrequent position update from the vision system due to computational demands and imperfect motion model uh, used to obtain the high rate state estimates required by the controller. And so we present a control design using only input and flat output or position data in our case and bypass the need for a higher dimensional state. And the reason that we can do this is that we exploit um, discrete time flatness. And int intuitively what this says is that the trajectory of the flat output in a certain finite window uniquely determines the state and input at any time step. And so we compare the performance of our controller with controllers that rely on a full state estimate from vision-based navigation. So we compare it to a PD controller, a flatness-based model predictive controller, and the proposed discrete time flatness controller. So we compare the flight at three meters per second. So the black L is the teach path, and we show the closed loop path when repeating under vision-based navigation using PD control in green, uh, flatness-based MPC, in blue and uh, our discrete flatness in, in red. So we can also look at a desired speed of nine meters per second. So I'll let these little videos play. And uh, in the PD control case, uh, we actually went unstable and I had to take over to avoid crashing. So <laughs> if you're wondering what happened there. <laughs> So we compared the path error averaged over multiple trials um, for increasing speed. So three, five, seven, nine meters per second. And we see that our discrete flatness outperforms related controllers that rely on inaccurate state estimation. So our proposed controller can reach speeds up to 10 meters per second. And we had some fl fun flying uh, DSL around Utias. Um, there are a few more flights uh, in three dimensions that I just want to briefly show um, of us flying with the uh, vision and the speed flatness in the loop. I also wanted to mention that all the data that I've spoken about and has been used in my thesis has been combined into a data set, and we call it Cloud Canadian Long Term Outdoor UAV Data Set. And it is one of the largest outdoor visual inertial UAV data sets. And it is well suited to test the robustness of visual localization across different locations, different times of day and different seasons. Um, it has a few interesting features, including water, grassland, trees, sun, air, and snow that make visual navigation challenging. And moreover, it includes Google Earth images sampled along the paths to enable future work using satellite images for localization. So compared to related visual inertial UAV data sets, cloud contains three distinct outdoor environments, uh, Google Earth images and totals over 30, 30 kilometers of flight data. So today I've presented a brief overview of the work in my thesis. This has resulted in a number of publications and contributions, which I want to highlight above. So in terms of future work, what's next? <laughs> so in this thesis, we assumed that the, that the system is differentially flat in known and measured flat output. So future work, work should investigate certifying when the property of differential flatness can be safely exploited by using data from physical robotic systems. In this thesis, we presented a perception model to capture the limitations of feature-based visual localization approaches. And future work should look into developing similar models for recent robust localization methods, such as mutual information or kernel-based approaches. Um, in this thesis, we presented a model-based predictive controller by exploiting discrete time flatness to bypass the full state estimate. And this property can be exploited in future work that explores learning-based control or reinforcement used learning using a window of input and output data. 
So briefly, I want to mention that I'll be starting as an assistant professor at Queen's in September. So if you're interested or know someone who might be, check out my lab website and feel free to email me. <laughs> and finally, uh, I thought I would end with a few pictures uh, taken over the years. Uh, thank you to my lab mates, my thesis committee, and my supervisor, Professor Angela Schulich. I've learned so much from you. It has been an honor. Thank you.